So this uh, is a paper uh, joined with Isa Hafaler, Fuito Kojima, and Koji Okote. We are look at an institution that has uh, two goals. One of them is diversity, and the second one is uh, meritocracy. We provide optimal solutions to the institution, and we consider this institution in a bigger, larger uh, market setting uh, later. But most of the talk will focus on only uh, one institution. So meritocracy has been idealized since ancient times. The um, Chinese philosopher Confucius uh, saw uh, that you know meritocracy was uh, good, but it was uh, impossible to achieve. However, uh, his ideals were adopted by the Han Dynasty that adopted civil service examinations to choose and uh, promote uh, officials. Likewise, the Greek philosopher Plato thought that uh, all rulers should be philosopher kings. Uh, well, he didn't become a philosopher king, uh, but again, his ideals uh, lived in the Greek uh, society. If you uh, think about meritocracy uh, as follows, then uh, we start to have some, uh, some questions about it. For example, meritocracy could be implemented as, you know, like having an exam and everybody takes the exam and whoever does well uh, is chosen and they become officials, you know, they, uh, they can attend the college and so on. So, of course, uh, this is great uh, in theory. However, uh, students need to often uh, prepare for these exams. And then if you come from uh, a privileged background, then you can have, you know, like tutors that will prepare you for the exam and you will uh, you will do uh, better so meritocracy uh, sometimes is thought as a trap because it will not uh, promote the underrepresented minorities as a result affirmative action and diversity policies have been implemented uh, worldwide in many countries including india china uh, chile brazil and the united states Nowadays, uh, diversity is so important even for tech companies. Every year they uh, report numbers on their workforce and uh, there are firms that uh, rank uh, firms on uh, the basis of diversity. And there are many books on written uh, on this topic. Is uh, merit really a tyranny? Is diversity a bargain? Well, these are really hard questions to answer. But what is really easy to see is that there is sometimes a simple trade-off between diversity and meritocracy. Let's consider the following example. Suppose that there is one university that is going to admit a new class of undergraduate students. The university is going to admit two students and there are preferences for diversity. There are two types of students. Female students are uh, written in red and male students are written in blue. And there are three applicants, Anne, Bella, and Charlie. Anne and Bella are female students, and male, uh, Charlie is a male student. Let's suppose that the university ranks these students as follows. Anne is the best student, and then Bella, and then Charlie. These students are all very good. The university wants to admit two of them. Now, uh, there are three classes that the university can admit. The first class has Anne and Bella. The second class has Anne and Charlie. And the last class has Bella and Charlie. Now, if the preference for diversity is not strong, then perhaps this university should admit the first class that has Anne and Bella, because these two students are the best students. They are both better than Charlie. However, if the preference for diversity is strong, then the university should consider either the second class that has Anne and Charlie or the third class that has Bella and Charlie. Now, these two sets are both diverse. However, they differ in their female student. This, uh, the first set has Anne, the other one has Bella. Now, because Anne is a better student than Bella, according to the university, so the last class that has Bella and Charlie should never be chosen. And depending on the strength of diversity, the university should admit either the first class or the second class. This trade-off between diversity and meritocracy can be uh, sometimes contentious. There, there was a, a Supreme Court case against uh, Harvard College and University of North Carolina here in the United States. And the Supreme Court ruled that 
race cannot be used uh, in college admissions. So now it's illegal to use race. So what do we do in this paper? Our main goal is to provide optimal solutions for an institution that has preferences for diversity. We provide a class of choice rules that maximize merit subjecting to, subject to attaining a diversity level indexed by the diversity level. We study uh, the desirable properties of these choice rules, such as path independence and the law of aggregate demand. Using this class, we identify the diversity merit part of the frontier. So if the university doesn't know the diversity level that they want, you can uh, give them the part of the frontier and the university can choose from these options. And finally, uh, to get to these results, we provide two uh, novel characterizations of metroids. I will not talk about the metroid characterizations in the talk, but uh, they are in the paper if you're interested, and I'm also happy to talk about them uh, after the talk. There are uh, some potential applications, including college admissions, uh, school assignment when we assign students to public schools, public and private hiring, and also uh, some auctions uh, have distributional objectives. For example, the government may want to promote minority-owned businesses in procurement auctions. And uh, the application that will be our focus is college admissions. So everything will be termed in terms of the college admissions application. Now, if uh, there are no questions about the motivation, uh, I'm happy to go into the model. Right. So um, we're going to assume that there is one university in most of the talk. Uh, think about Washington University in St. Louis. The university has a set of schools denoted by calligraphic C. So this could be uh, the majors that students can apply to after high school. If the university uh, hires, uh, excuse me, accepts uh, uh, students uh, to only one major, then uh, calligraphic C is just a singleton. But it could be that the students are admitted to, to different schools within the university. It could be that School of Engineering does its own admissions, School of uh, the Business School, School of, School of Arts and Sciences, and so on. So uh, those schools will be denoted by calligraphic C. There is a set of students. Uh, calligraphic S will be the set of students. Now, um, because we're interested in uh, diversity, we introduce types for students. Each student has a type. A type has all the attributes that the university cares about in terms of diversity. For example, my type could be minority veteran, right? So type, types could specify also gender, uh, race, and uh, whatever the university is interested about, uh, in terms of diversity. So that's the um, set of agents and traits. How do we define merit in our setting? Well, merit, uh, the dictionary definition of merit is the quality of being particularly good or worthy. So the merit is an individual thing. The university will consider all of the applications. Now, an application will be denoted by a contract. A contract will specify a student, a school within the university, and the terms. For example, the terms could include uh, financial aid. And the set of all contracts is going to be denoted by a calligraphic X. Now, the university will be able to rank all contracts. That's the merit ranking. It's denoted by succeeds. And its uh, weak part is denoted as succeeds or is equal to. Now the university can rank all the applications. However, we need to compare sets of applications, the different classes that we can admit. So we need to extend this uh, merit ranking to sets. How do we do that? We use this uh, merit domination relation. Let's consider two sets of contracts, set X and set Y. And uh, let's uh, rank contracts within each set according to the merit ranking. So in set X, X1 is the most preferred um, 
contract and then X2 and so on and so forth. And in set Y, Y1 is the uh, contract with the most merit and then Y2 and so on and so forth. We're going to say that set X dominates, merit dominates set Y if X has weakly more contracts compared to Y and for every I, XI uh, has higher merit than YI. So if you compare the best contracts in each set, X has the weekly more um, meritous uh, contract and so forth, uh, so on and so forth for the second best contract, the third best contract and so on and so forth. And uh, how about diversity? Well, the dictionary definition of diversity is as follows. Diversity is the practice or quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds and of different genders, sexual orientations, etc. So the diversity is a property of the whole set, the whole class that you're admitting. To define it, we look at the we look at distributions of students at different schools. So what is a distribution? Well, a distribution is a big vector. So what we do is, given a set of students, we count how many minority veteran, uh, veteran students are in uh, school one, how many, uh, how many minority veteran students are in school two, and so on and so forth. For each type, we count how many students of this type are in each school. And we just stack those numbers in a big vector and we call that the distribution, right? So the, this distribution tells us how many female students are admitted to School of Engineering, School of Arts and Sciences, and so on and so forth for each type that we have. Now, we may have some feasibility uh, considerations, constraints. For example, the School of Arts and Sciences may want to admit at most 100 students. The set of all feasible distributions is denoted by uppercase C uh, zero. And the generic distribution is denoted by Xi. And how do we uh, define diversity? The diversity takes a feasible distribution. It's a function. It takes a feasible distribution and it puts out a number. If this number goes up, that means we have a more diverse set. If this number goes down, that means we have a less diverse set. So you can think about the Gini index or like any diversity index uh, that uh, we are familiar with. And now, uh, given a set of contracts X, we can look at the distribution induced by this set that will be denoted by C of X, right? So in this class, okay, in class X, we will count how many female students are in College of Engineering, uh, School of Engineering, how many uh, female students are in School of Arts and Sciences, and so on and so forth. That will be the distribution induced by matching X or class X. All right. Uh, I think there's a question, Bernard. Yeah, thanks. Um, so can you go back two slides, please? Oh, two slides. Um... So why do you need this comparison of the sizes of the classes? Uh, that's a good question. So we don't actually need it. So we're making this uh, merit domination especially strong because it's going to make our uh, results stronger. Okay. So, I mean, we could think of other, uh, other set comparisons and then uh, as long as uh, the set comparison is weaker uh, than this one, the results are going to hold. And I agree that, you know, this is a particularly a strong set comparison, but it's just going to make our results stronger. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Our solution concept is a choice rule. Given a set of contracts X, we are supposed to choose a subset. Which applications do we admit? Um, and uh, there's only one construct that the induced distribution must be feasible, right? If the College of Engineering uh, has a capacity of 100, we cannot admit more than 100 students to the College of Engineering. All right, so let me go a little bit further before taking a break. Uh, I think um, I will uh, now introduce uh, a restriction on the diversity index, it will be a notion of concavity. 
And then uh, I will go our, over our first result and then we can uh, take a small break and uh, get more questions. So uh, first, so we are interested in a class of choice rules. So maximize merit subject to attaining a diversity level. Now uh, we will start with an extreme member of this class. We're going to maximize diversity first and then merit subject to attaining this uh, highest diversity level. Right, so it's a lexicographic maximization of diversity first and then merit. The input uh, to the choice rule is going to be a set of contracts, and we're, we're going to call this uh, choice rule the diversity choice rule. We're, look, we're going to look at all possible distributions of students that we can admit. We're going to maximize diversity, and it's going to give us possibly uh, more than one distribution that maximizes diversity. And then we're going to find all sets that will give us the optimal diversity level. And from this, we're going to choose the set that has the highest merit. Now we can uh, come back to Bernard's question. So because the uh, set comparison is very strong, this may not actually exist, right? So our question will be, when is this well-defined and when is it well-behaved? So we're going to be especially interested in the computational aspects because we want to be able to implement this in practice. So we're going to impose a restriction on the diversity index and we call, uh, so this uh, notion is called semi-strict quasi and natural concavity in discrete convex analysis uh, literature, but we're just going to call it ordinal concavity, okay? Uh, so it is due to Murota and Shioura, and uh, it uh, states the following. A function f is ordinarily concave if we take two distributions, xi and xi tilde, and a dimension, which is a school and a type, such that in xi, we have more type T students at school C compared to xi tilde, then one of the following six conditions has to hold. So there are six conditions, and uh, as long as one of them holds, this uh, ordinal concavity is going to be satisfied. So we have these two distributions. So let me... Now we will move from these two distributions towards each other, but moving towards each other can uh, have two possible meanings. Okay, at distribution C, we have more type T students at school C, so this is greater than this. Now first we're going to move towards each other in this dimension by adding one here and subtracting one here. Now, when we do that, if the diversity index goes up on either side or it remains on both sides, then ordinal concavity is satisfied. Okay, so these are the first three conditions. Or there exists a second dimension. Let's call it C prime T prime, such that at C tilde, we have more compared to C. And now going towards each other will mean two moves. So we are, we're going to add from C tilde, we add one in the dimension CT and we're going to subtract one in the dimension C prime T prime. And we're going to do the opposite operations from C. Now we have these two new distributions and then we do these two operations, either the diversity index should go up or it should remain the same on both sides. So you may have uh, seen two other notions uh, in the discrete uh, convex analysis literature called M concavity for metroid concavity and M natural concavity. These are both cardinal notions and they are both uh, stronger than ordinal concavity. We like ordinal concavity because one, it's weaker than these two notions and two, it's an ordinal notion. So the absolute values that you put on the diversity index uh, is not important, only the uh, ranking uh, is important. Now, so we talked about this in, uh, okay, but let's to look at a special case when uh, there is one school C and there is one type T. In that uh, special case, four, five, and six cannot hold because there doesn't exist a second dimension. In this case, one, two, or three needs to hold. What does one mean? 
So xi is greater than xi tilde. And when we move from xi to xi tilde, what we're doing is subtracting one. If the diverse index goes up, then uh, ordinal concavity is satisfied. The second possibility is when we move from xi tilde towards uh, xi by adding one, then uh, we compare f of xi tilde plus one and f of xi tilde. If the first one is greater, then ordinal concavity is satisfied. Or if when you do these two operations, diversity index doesn't change, then ordinal concavity is satisfied. So in this uh, one dimensional case, you can think of ordinal concavity as a generalization of single peakedness, but there can be a plateau on top. So maybe it's we can call it single plateau, uh, preferences with single plateau. And of course, in the multidimensional case, it's even uh, more general. So if you like uh, compact uh, representations, you can introduce a zero vector by chi zero zero and ordinal concavity can also be written in this more compact form, but it's the same thing. Now let's look at a couple of examples uh, that satisfies ordinal concavity. So much of the uh, literature on in market design uh, has focused on these so-called reserves. So what you do is you reserve a number of seats at every school to uh, to the minorities, so we can uh, we can uh, we can represent that as an ordinarily concave diversity index. For at each school C, for each type T, we reserve a number of seats. That's called that RCT, and now we can define our diversity index as follows: for any given distribution C, so the diversity index goes up by one for every reserved seat that you can fill. So at the School of Engineering, we reserve 10 seats for minorities. Uh, so therefore, the diversity index will go up by one with the number of minority students admitted to the School of Engineering up to 10 students. After that, it will be flat. So this is ordinarily concave. Now, uh, the marginal diversity that a student brings can go down, right? So the first minority student is really important uh, and it will increase our diversity by a lot. And the second one is still important, but the marginal uh, diversity it brings is going to go down. So we can incorporate these uh, students as well. For each school C and type T, we have a concave function GCT. And if the diversity index is given by this function, then uh, it satisfies ordinal concavity. And finally, so we can look at uh, diversity in terms of you know, uh, different types of students that we're admitting at each school, but the university may also care about the number of minority students that the university has, regardless of which school within the university they are attending to. We can also incorporate that Let's suppose that uh, there is a set of types called minority types, M. And now the university calculates how many minority students that it has at all schools within the university. And H is a concave function. And then we have this uh, other component that each minority student uh, brings in diverse to, to the individual uh, schools. So this will also satisfy ordinal concavity. Right, so we can uh, look at diversity at individual uh, schools within the university as well as the diversity at the whole school. So these are all ordinarily uh, concave uh, diversity indices. Now, given uh, ordinal concavity, now we can define our uh, diversity choice rule more formally. It's going to be denoted by CD. Now, the input is a set of contracts, X. At first, we look at all possible distributions that we can have. If I have 30 male applicants and 30 female applicants, and my capacity is 50, then what are the possible distributions? Well, I can have 30, <clears throat> so let's just draw this, right? So 30 male and 30 female, and now, uh, so here, 
and the capacity, overall capacity is 50. All right. So this is supposed to be 20. This is supposed to be 20. So these are all the possible distributions. All right. And now, so I couldn't draw that. Now, uh, from this set, we maximize diversity. So that's step one. Step two, now let's say that um, there are two points. Uh, there, are, there could be several distributions that maximize uh, diversity. Now, at step two, we start admitting students one by one according to the merit ranking. We just check that at every step, the distribution of the set of students that we have is weakly dominated by an optimal distribution, a distribution that achieves the optimal diversity level. Let's say that uh, we have 25, 25 as the optimal distribution that maximizes diversity. So we admit students, we start admitting students one by one. But as soon as we, we have admitted 25 female students, we stop admitting more female students because uh, we want to arrive at the distribution 25, 25, that is uh, optimal in terms of diversity. And likewise, whenever we reach 25 for male students, we stop admitting more male students because we want to arrive at an optimal distribution of 25 male and 25 female students. All right, so that's the, uh, that's the idea. <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> why does this work well? Well, uh, we have the following result. This is our uh, first main result. Suppose that the diversity index F is ordinarily concave, then for any set of contracts X. Now one, the chosen set maximizes diversity among all subsets of X. So this should be trivial because by construction, we make sure that we arrive at an optimal distribution. We're adding students one by one and we're imposing constraints so that we arrive at an optimal distribution, a distribution that maximizes diversity. But now two says that the outcome of the choice rule merit dominates any subset of X that maximizes diversity. Now, if you want to have 25 male students and 25 female students, when there are 30 applicants of each gender, then there are many sets that will get you 25 male students and 25 female students. So two says that whatever we choose, merit dominates any other set that achieves the optimal diversity level. And finally, the third uh, part is about computational complex uh, complexity. The outcome uh, of the uh, choice rule can be calculated in polynomial time. So the proof, uh, so part one uh, is just by construction. We don't have to do anything. So uh, I'll focus on the proof of part two. And here we're going to make connections to a notion of convexity called metroid convexity or M convexity in discrete convex analysis literature. And then metroids and the greedy algorithm used in uh, combinatorial optimization literature. So part three is like, uh, so we need to be careful in finding the optimal uh, distributions that maximize diversity, but uh, we do it in a computationally efficient way uh, in the proof. And then we provide two results, uh, generalizing maximizer cut theorem and the domain reduction algorithm uh, in uh, from the uh, discrete convex analysis literature. Arda has a question. Well, yeah, I'm just wondering, Sorry, is is there a sense in which the ordinal concavity is like a minimal necessary condition? So uh, it will uh, be indeed. Uh, so I will talk about that later uh, after the second result. Um, so not for this result, but we're going to look at uh, the the condition that gives us the existence of a stable matching. So this won't be substitutability because substitutability does not guarantee the existence of a stable matching. So you need a slightly stronger condition than substitutability called path independence. We have a follow-up paper and we show that if you want path independence uh, to be satisfied, then uh, you need ordinal concavity. Thank you. So it's a follow-up paper. Uh, so I can uh, send you the link after the talk if that's okay. Thank you. So I think this is a good time to take a break and receive any other questions if there are any. This might be maybe a little bit too technical, but I'd be curious if you could talk just a little bit about 
how you find the um, distribution that maximizes diversity, this sort of third part? Well, sure. Uh, hi, Nick. Um, so I think, yeah, so Nick has a question uh, about the last part. So how do we find the optimal distributions? So uh, ordinal concavity uh, delivers us two things. So one, the uh, optimal, like if you find a, a locally maximum uh, di uh, distribution, then it will be also globally maximum. So that's one of the results that we use. Two, if let's say that if you read the distribution that is not optimal, so there is a uh, there's a better distribution, then you can move towards that distribution in one step that will increase the diversity level. So this will uh, this allows us to do the following. We start from the origin, the zero distribution, the zero vector. And then we check whether the zero vector is optimal or not, right? If it's not optimal, then there has to exist a, a direction. And then when we add one in one of the directions, the diversity index should go up. So we find that direction. So we check locally, and then we find a direction in which the diversity index can be increased, and we move in that direction. Once we do that, we can cut the domain. So, uh, and we impose that, now uh, we are doing a constraint maximization and that in this dimension, the coordinate has to be at least one, but the domain reduction algorithm result tells us, or the maximizer cut theorem tells us that uh, that's indeed without loss of generality. And then from, uh, so we go step by step and then we find a local maximum. The local maximum will be global maximum. And then we do a local search to find all of the distributions uh, that are uh, that are optimal. I think there's a second question. Thank you. Yeah. In, in uh, two, uh, can you um, can you weaken the the order to make the the theorem stronger, like expand the uh, uh, something weaker, but it dominates. Um, X to all diversity, not just the maximized diversity. Oh, uh, so uh, so the question is whether we can uh, generalize part two so that the outcome of the choice rule uh, merely dominates any subset of X that is that's that's feasible. Let's say so that won't be uh, that won't uh, hold. Yeah, so like you can find examples. I mean, very easy because. Uh, it could be that uh, the diversity constraint imposes you to accept students with lower merit. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, so uh, the second part uh, will not hold uh, if you want to generalize this to uh, all uh, feasible sets. One more question. Yeah. Do you have like a simple example of a maybe a, a rule that you would a diversity rule you'd consider to be pretty natural, but that is not ordinarily concave? Um, so the uh, diversity index or uh, choice rule? Sorry. Uh, Sorry, diver diversity index. Yeah. Yes. So the diversity indices uh, based on proportions, I think, uh, may not satisfy ordinal concavity. So let's look at like Shannon entropy, like, uh, so there are these diversity indices. Um, the, the idea is as follows. So you take, you look at your population and you pick uh, two types randomly and you look at the probability that the two randomly picked individuals have the same type or not. Uh, so if this probability goes up, uh, then your uh, if the probability that two types are the same, then diversity is less, and the probability that uh, the randomly picked two individuals have the same type is lower, then diversity is higher. So the indices uh, based on this intuition uh, in general will not satisfy ordinal concavity. And uh, I mean, if you like, and then uh, in terms of the choice rules, the choice rules. Uh, use then let's say like the city of Chicago or like the vertical reservations in India where first you admit anybody regardless of their type 
and then you admit students based on their type at the end. So these choice rules also uh, will not be representable in this fashion. Can can students have uh, multiple type? Yes. So uh, I mean, uh, no, no. So let me be careful. So there is only one type, but the type will specify all the attributes that the student uh, has. So the type can specify gender, race, socioeconomic status, so anything you want. So of course, I mean, depending on the interpretation of what a type is, then ordinal concavity will have a different interpretation. But uh, the mathematically is just one dimension, right? Yes, mathematically, yes, uh, one dimension. Yeah, one dimensional types, yeah. Olivier, should, should I continue? Yeah, yeah, I think you should continue, yeah. All right, uh, thank you for the questions and uh, you can keep them coming. Um, just let me know. Okay, no, so now uh, we're going to look at the intuition or the steps uh, for the proof of part two, right? So the outcome of the uh, choice rule merit dominates any subset of X that maximizes diversity. Now, in the first step, we're uh, maximizing diversity subject to uh, feasibility given the set of students that we have. So let's call uh, the set of optimal distributions C star of X. We know at least, because everything is finite, we know at least uh, one solution exists, but in general, there will be more than one. Now, what we show is that, like, if you look at the maximal distributions in the set C star of X, it will form a convex set. So the notion of convexity is called metroid convexity or M convexity. Okay, so the Pareto frontier, like if you want, uh, if you want to use that term, the uh, Pareto frontier of the set is well behaved and it is convex. Now, so once you find these maximal distributions, now you want to look at sets that are uh, that have a distribution uh, either at the optimal distributions or anything less than that, right? So. If you want to think of it uh, as follows, it's also fine. So these are the sets that we can admit depending on the merit ranking of the contracts, right? So let's call those sets uh, f of x. So the next step is to show that uh, x and f of x forms a metroid. So now metroid uh, is used in uh, combinatorial optimization literature and basically for the pair X and F of X to form a metroid, we need to satisfy three uh, conditions. So one, it should be non-empty. Well, that's uh, trivial. Two, if a set is uh, in the, if a set is uh, feasible, every such subset should also be feasible. That's also satisfied. And the last one uh, says that if you take two feasible sets, uh, then from one, uh, you can take a contract and add it to the other one, and that should also be feasible. But so this is great. So once you have a metroid structure, then you can use the so-called greedy algorithm to find the optimal set. Okay. And so for this uh, second step, uh, for the lemma, we use the M convexity of the maximal distributions in CSR X, and also we have to use a new characterization of metroids that we provide. And the third step shows that the greedy rule outcome on this metroid that we constructed is equal to the diversity choice rule outcome. And finally, we use a result from uh, Gale, and uh, this result states the following, the greedy rule outcome merit dominates any independent set of the underlying metroid. So what are those independent sets? Those independent sets are all members of this set f of x. So therefore, we can say that the outcome of the diversity choice rule merit, do merit dominates any member of f of x, in particular, those sets that achieve the maximal diversity level. Okay, so uh, part two is then... Uh, going to follow from uh, Gale's uh, result and uh, the other lemmas that we have uh, proven. Now let's look at an example and see how this works. Uh, suppose that there is one school within the university, so the school and the university are the same, 
there is a capacity of two and there are three students of different types. Uh, each student can be admitted in a unique way and let's call uh, the contract with these students X, Y, and Z. And let's suppose that X, is, uh, X has, has higher merit than Y and Y has higher merit than Z. And let's define the diversity index as follows. If nobody is admitted, the diversity is zero. If uh, X is admitted or Y is admitted, or they are admitted at the same time, the diversity is one. And if Z is admitted with uh, alone or with X or Y, then the diversity uh, value is five, okay? And let's consider the case when everybody applies. So uh, what is the first step? The first step is finding the distributions that maximize diversity. Now, which distributions maximize diversity? Well, the optimal diversity level is five. Therefore, we need the distribution uh, of the sets. Either we admit only Z or X and Z or Y and Z. Okay, so this uh, C star of X is the set of optimal uh, distributions. So that's great. Now we find the maximal distributions in this set. The maximal distributions is, okay, so we have either X and Z together or Y and Z together. Because the distribution induced by Z is dominated by the distribution induced by X and Z, for example. And uh, our lemma says that this set, the set of maximal distributions in Z star X is an M convex set. All right. Now we look at all sets that have a distribution dominated by either the distribution of X and Z or the distribution of Y and Z. Now think about it as sets, subsets of X and Z and subsets of Y and Z, right? So what do we have then? Empty sets, sets including only X, only Y, only Z, X and Z, and Y and Z. Our second lemma says that this is a metroid. And now by uh, our third lemma, we know that the outcome of the diversity choice rule will be the greedy rule applied to this particular metroid. Now, in order to apply the greedy algorithm on the metroid, we need to know the ranking. The ranking was X and then Y and then Z. Now, first we consider set X, uh, set including only X. Is that feasible? Yes, indeed, right? So we choose X. Now next is uh, Y. So we look at, if we include Y with X, is that a feasible set? Now X and Y is not a feasible set because it's not in the Metroid. So we cannot choose Y. We move on to Z. Now we look at X and Z. Is that a feasible set? The answer is yes, because it's in the Metroid. Then uh, we choose Z and we stop. So the outcome of the diversity choice rule selects contracts X and Z. All right, now uh, let's talk about two-sided markets. Uh, as I said uh, before the break, the substitutes condition alone does not guarantee the existence of a stable matching when choice rules are the primitive of your model. What you need is a slightly stronger condition than the substitutes condition called path independence. So path independence was originally defined by Charlie Plott uh, in a paper uh, studying social choice. It states the following. If we consider two con uh, sets of contracts, X prime and X, we can apply the choice rule to X prime union X. And that should be the same as first applying the choice rule to set X prime, taking the union with the set X and then applying the choice rule again. So in words, give us a set of contracts. You can chop it in any subsets. These subsets can have overlap. And then what we do is we apply our criteria, our choice rule to each subset. And then we apply our choice rule again. So the outcome uh, should not depend on these subsets that we've selected. And it doesn't matter in which order we've applied the choice rule. For example, uh, if you're admitting graduate students, uh, then so what do we do? Well, uh, there is uh, there's a head of the committee. The head of the committee gives batches of students to different faculty. Different faculty apply a set of criteria. 
and then shortlists a set of students and sends it back to the faculty in charge. The faculty in charge considers all the shortlisted students and from that set of students chooses the uh, graduate students to admit. So if every faculty is using the same set of criteria, so in other words, if every faculty is using the same choice rule, then it shouldn't matter how the uh, batches are selected and in which order uh, these candidates are evaluated. At the end of the day, we're always going to admit the same set of students. So path independence alone in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in an institutional setting is also a very desirable property and not only in two-sided markets. Now, uh, as long as the diversity index is ordinarily concave, then the diversity choice rule actually does satisfy path independence. And uh, as I talked, uh, so Arda, I think, asked the question. So we show in a follow-up paper that ordinal concavity is actually necessary to get path independence. So you cannot weaken uh, ordinal concavity in a sense. Now, uh, let's consider centralized markets uh, for example, via the gale shapley Deferred Acceptance Algorithm, we know that uh, the gale shapley Deferred Acceptance Algorithm is strategy-proof for students if the choice rule satisfied path independence and the low O aggregate demand. So what is the low O aggregate demand? The low O aggregate demand states that when we have more contracts, uh, then we shouldn't choose uh, less, strictly less students. Okay. If we get more applications, the number of students that we choose should increase uh, weekly. It shouldn't decrease. Does the diversity choice rule satisfy LAD? Unfortunately, the answer is no, not necessarily. Therefore, uh, we introduce the following uh, condition that we call size-restricted concavity. Size-restricted concavity is similar to the ordinal concavity in that we move towards uh, two distributions uh, from one to the other one, uh, but it is only imposed on two distributions, Xi and Xi tilde, such that there are more students at Xi compared to Xi tilde. And again, when we move towards each other, either the diverse index should go up or the diverse index should remain the same on both sides. And our results state the following. If the diversity index is ordinarily concave and size restricted concave, then the diversity choice rule satisfies the low O aggregate demand in addition to path independence that we've showed in the previous uh, results. Now, again, we can, uh, we can think about weakening size-restricted concavity to achieve the low O aggregate demand, but we show in the follow-up paper that it is not possible. Size-restricted concavity is, in a sense, necessary to get the low O aggregate demand. Now, um, I have eight minutes left. So now, uh, so we focused on the diversity choice rule. It does lexicographic maximization of diversity first and then merit. And of course, you can say that that's extreme. So not many institutions do that, right? So maybe they have a diversity level and they want to maximize uh, the merit subject to attaining the diversity level. So as long as we have enough diversity, I want to choose the most uh, qualified students. So... After we got uh, our first set of results, we were talking and I told uh, my co-author that, okay, we need to define a new choice rule and then we need to show the same set of results for this new choice rule. And they said, no, we don't have to do that. All we have to do is modify the diversity index and apply the same choice rule for the modified diversity index. So how do we modify it? If lambda is your target diversity level, you cap the diversity index at lambda. So define F lambda so that F lambda of Xi is minimum of the diversity level at Xi and lambda. So it just uh, chops up the top part and replaces with lambda. And the, a simple observation is that the diversity choice rule for F lambda is equal to maximizing the merit scores subject to achieving this diversity level of lambda. So as long as F lambda satisfies the conditions that we've imposed, the results that I've shown you still continue to hold. Now, let's call this uh, new choice rule CD lambda. Now, I'm going to use this class uh, to define a new algorithm to find the diversity merit part of the frontier. If delta is the 
minimum difference between diversity levels. For example, in the previous example, everything was integer. So perhaps we can take delta as one, right? Now, what we do is as follows. First, we ignore diversity and then we maximize merit. That set will get a uh, diversity level. Now, we increase the diversity level uh, of that set by delta, and then we apply the diversity choice rule for lambda uh, that's equal to delta plus the diversity level achieved at first. And then we continue in this fashion. So this will start at the most, uh, the set with the highest merit, and it will go down and it will trace the Pareto frontier. All right, so do I have an example? Yes, I'll, I'll show you in the example how it works exactly, but just to save time, let me skip that and show you the result. If F lambda is ordinarily concave for every lambda, this trace algorithm finds the diversity merit part of frontier. And it's no longer guaranteed to be polynomial, but it is pseudo polynomial. Now, let me show you how it works in the example that uh, we discussed before. To make this example more interesting, I'm going to modify the diversity index so that F, uh, the diversity, if Z is accepted alone is eight, just uh, to make it look more interesting. Because everything is integer, we can take delta to be one, or this is, this is the minimum difference that the diversity index takes, as you can see. Everybody applies. Now, if everybody applies, and uh, we are just maximizing merit. Okay, no, if everybody applies, right? And then we apply the standard diversity uh, choice rule, we maximize diversity first, but that gives us the whole set. There's only one set that achieves the diversity level, right? So keep this in mind. This will be crucial uh, to uh, tell when the algorithm actually stops. All right, so this is when we're gonna stop. Now, first we ignore diversity, right? So let's say that the diversity index is capped at zero. Now, what do we do? We maximize merit. Now, uh, because X is better than Y, Y is better than Z, we're going to choose X and Y, right? X, Y, Z is infeasible, so we cannot choose that. So at the first step, we choose the set including X and Y, and it gives us a diversity level of one. Now we include, we add delta to one. So delta was one, so we get two, and we kept the diversity index at two. Now we apply the diversity choice rule for this modified diversity index. So subject to achieving two, choose the set with the highest merit, and because X is better than Y, Y is better than Z, we choose X and Z. X and Z gives us the diversity level of five. Now we add another delta, then we get six, and we cap the diversity level at six, and we apply the diversity choice rule again. Subject to attaining a diversity level of six, what is the most, uh, what is the set with the highest merit? Then there's only one set, and we get Z. So we came to the diversity choice rule outcome for the original diversity index. So that means we can stop because we cannot get a set with greater diversity, right? So there's no point of continuing because we already uh, got the set with the uh, highest diversity number. And that's the outcome. There are the other sets. So there are three other choices, only X, only X is here, only Y, only Y is here. The set including Y and Z, that's here. And the empty set is at the origin. So it's dominated by everything. Now, before finishing, so let's consider the condition uh, that we impose for the trace algorithm to work well. We impose that F lambda satisfies ordinal concavity for every lambda. When is that satisfied? So what is the condition of the diversity index F so that F lambda satisfies ordinal concavity for every lambda. So this result tells us that's true if and only if F satisfies a condition that we call pseudo M natural concave plus. So I apologize for the name. So why this name? Well, 
There is already a condition that's called pseudo M natural concave that we defined in a previous paper. Um, so it is this condition. So this condition is actually quite intuitive. It just imposes that the upper counter sets are M natural convex, okay? But we need something stronger than that. So um, we just added plus because of that. And what is it? Okay, first, like if we impose pseudo M natural concavity instead of ordinal concavity, everything is going to hold except the computational complexity results. Now, uh, what is pseudo M natural concave plus? I will show it to you and I'll wait for five seconds without making any comments and then we can move on. All right. So uh, I guess I have some time for the related literature discussion. So I already told you about our follow-up paper. So maybe this should be 2023, where we discuss um, why these conditions that we imposed uh, are necessary in a sense, ordinal concavity and uh, size restricts concavity. Imamura Kenzo um, studies diversity and meritocracy for choice rules that have reserves and quotas. And uh, he provides axioms uh, in terms of diversity and meritocracy for, for choice rules. And he provides axiomatic characterizations of these choice rules. Fujijike and Yang uh, were one of the first to study um, M natural concavity in a two-sided matching market. And they showed that if there is a utility function which is rationalized by a M natural concave function, then there exists a stable matching. And Kojima, Tamura, and Yoko show that many, uh, many of the choice rules uh, that we've studied in market design with distributional objectives can be justified using M naturally concave uh, utility functions. So I think I'm out of time. Thank you everybody for attending and thank you for the questions. So I'll be here and if you have any other questions, I think uh, you're free to ask. In in practice, is this uh, easy for student to affect the type, their type? Oh, is it uh, easy, easy for easy. them to? Or for student to change the type? Oh, that's a good question. So we assume that the types are uh, fixed and fixed, and the and the institute uh, and the students cannot change it. So, for example, like like being let's say coming from a like let's say race so these are like reported and um, we assume that uh, students report truthfully okay. but uh, you could study when you know like it is uh, optimal to report truthfully of course so that's another question in, i mean it's illegal in some settings in some settings you cannot actually lie about your types for example in india you need to report your cost and then you need to get a, a cost report from the government. So you cannot actually lie about your cost. So uh, whether you can lie about your type or not, I think will depend on the institutional setting. I see. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Mustafa, can keep the question. Uh, hi, Bumin. Uh, can you extend the results to include uh, the probability of a student who is admitted to actually come to the university? Oh, I see. So, like, you want to maybe, like, uh, in a setting like the United States, uh, where students can be uh, admitted to multiple colleges at the same time. So, this is a great question that we haven't thought about. Um, so, one way of doing this may be as follows. So, maybe you assign uh, a probability to, uh, to the student uh, to actually attend. And then when you calculate uh, the diversity index, you account for those probabilities. So in a setting uh, without diversity considerations, so I considered only the capacity of the school where the school had to calculate how many students are going to attend and they took these probabilities into account. Uh, so that's uh, paper is called like uh, a centralized clearinghouse for college admissions. Uh, it was published in Journal of Economic Theory, but I didn't consider diversity consideration, but that's a great question. I think uh, it should be investigated. Uh, 